Cool. Yeah. So I'll open my top secret folio. Okay. Um, not as secret as I might have hoped. Uh, so the first question that we should ask, uh, maybe general. Sure. Um, which position will you be seeking on the executive, uh, and why are you the best qualified for it? Um, okay. So in terms of running for executive, like I am interested in running for executive. In terms of what position, um, I think I'm primarily interested um, in vice president. The reason why um, I think I would be good at that role is because I think that um, I'm actually quite good at intuitively understanding um, people's like arguments in um, like in board meetings when people disagree about things and I find it quite easy to try to like reach consensus and to facilitate in that regard and I think that given that the remit of the vice president compared to other um, roles is quite vague. It kind of allows you to be flexible to kind of whatever situation that the board finds itself in next year. Another reason why I think I would be good at that role is because um, it's involved in like the staff negotiations. I think that that's something that um, I would be quite good at. And further from that as well, like I think like I would be good um, at the role because I have quite a lot of experience in a lot of different kind of um, aspects of the organisation, like through uh, like the transparency review, the ball review, creating like an ethnocultural portfolio as well as having gone to um, like finance meetings through my creation of the uh, divestment policy, some of which people listening probably uh, won't have any idea that I'm what I'm talking about. But I have kind of like moved around the organisation quite a bit. And so I think this role that is quite flexible, but also about creating board cohesion, uh, which obviously is something that we didn't necessarily have so much in the past year, is something that I would be good at. And that's why. Be cool. So, given your kind of large amount of experience in the organisation, why wouldn't mm. you be interested in running for president? Um, the reason why I wouldn't be interested in running for president is I actually think it's kind of like a function of um, being on like the left of the spectrum that it's more difficult to kind of seek um, any sort of political position if you're coming from like either side of politics. It's much easier to kind of have that coming uh, from the middle. But I think ultimately what I'm interested in is not kind of like the personal politics of being the president of the USU, but what I'm interested in is facilitating and working towards having a progressive executive that can actually make structural changes to the union. I see that is more important than any individual member of that executive having any particular position, and that's what I'm going to like be seeking throughout this kind of process. Uh, so who will you vote for? Um, well, of the people that are running at the moment, so there's, to my knowledge, Robbie and Tara and Tim. Um, I won't be voting for Tim. I've disagreed with him on numerous occasions about um, a lot of things within the organisation, but particularly, I guess, on the Tom Rowie issue as well. We obviously didn't um, necessarily see eye to eye on that issue. In terms of Tara and Robbie, I'm like 100% honestly, like, I'm not sure. I've worked with both of them in a number of different um, capacities, uh, like as I've worked with Tara on the Transparency Review, I've also worked with her on um, more recently, um, her and I have been trying to um, investigate the situation that's happening um, down in Redfern with the Aboriginal 10 Embassy. So we've had like quite a lot of um, interaction together and we work quite well. Equally with Robbie, like I really respect what he's done with the queer portfolio. He's been really supportive of me like during kind of Sex and Consent Day. Um, organising as well. At this stage, given that I haven't actually seen their proposals um, that they like are pr planning to run on for president, I don't think it would be prudent of me to actually assume that I do know exactly what either of their visions are. And so while I think they're both good candidates, I can't tell you right now which of the two I would vote for. Sure. So just maybe quickly then moving out of your generation of board executives, what have you thought about the most recent board executive and particularly the presidency of Hannah Morris? Um, in terms of the recent executive, it's obviously I don't really agree with the way that executive um, has acted. I've found that it's been quite hierarchical in terms of the way that it has interacted both internally but also with the board as a whole. Like often when, you know, after Tom came back from being you know, not able to perform his duties. They still didn't really seem like the executive were functioning that cohesively. It didn't seem like they were all setting regular meetings. I've never seen any meet minutes of meetings from an executive meeting. And it always felt like the executive knew things that the board didn't and that there wasn't always a free flow of information between the executive and the board. I think the role of the executive shouldn't be a body that sits above the board. Yes, it has decision-making capacity like delegated to it, but 
ultimately the executive is there to <clears throat> like promote the interests of the board as a whole and it should be seen as kind of like a hierarchical structure in that sense. In terms of the presidency of Hannah Morris, Hannah and I disagree on a number of different things um, about the union. Like I've really, like I've found a lot of elements of her presidency um, quite disappointing. In particular, um, obviously the motion uh, to remove Tom Rowley and lack of consultation with the board about the exact kind of like remit of the legal advice they were giving us, I found um, problematic. Like apart from that, um, I think with the whole Senate appointed directors kind of mm -hmm. gate or whatever that happened recently, I don't think that she was that consultative of the board during that as well. And I think that like perhaps it was circumstantial that the executive moved further and further apart. But I think as like on the whole, they've been like one, like a really poorly functioning executive. And I hope that if I am on executive, it will be nothing like that next year because that mm. would be good for me. Just, just a quick question on that poor functioning. Do you think it's mostly as a result of ideology or is it personality mm. politics or? Um, I think it's a combination. Like, I mean, maybe ideology is one thing, but there've been very different ideologies on a lot of different executives, like going like much further, you know, to the right of the spectrum. And while they have, you know, functioned, I think they functioned better than this executive. I think it was just probably a, a combination of, I don't know, tension building up about, well, firstly, like the role of board directors has kind of changed quite a lot over the past five years. And so I think that we're a lot more involved now. So for example, board directors didn't used to have um, weekly kind of like informal meetings. They used to only meet once a month. And now we meet every week. And on top of that, since I guess like last year when certain directors kind of did reviews of certain areas that has translated into this year there being a lot more kind of like active reviewing of aspects of the organization by the directors and then in addition to that there's also kind of been this kind of re like reinvigorated role of portfolios and so I think like the changing aspect of the board um, doing a lot more different things was quite turbulent um, on top of obviously the personal kind of um, political politics of there being a massive shake up in the sense that Tom presented quite a different ideology to what the board should be, and that hadn't really been seen before. Um, so what would uh, your executive do differently? Um, well, I think that there should be a review into completely how the executive functions in the, like in respect to um, the board itself. So what I mean by that is, like, should there be such a massive pay difference between what an executive member gets paid and a board member gets paid, how can the executive ensure that they like are delegated authority to make decisions on certain issues, but also have like the most information flowing through between um, themselves and the directors? And I think more than that, it should be up to the executive this year to facilitate precisely what they see uh, as the role of the union being in the coming years, and then to work actively to structurally change the union to accommodate for that. So if that means that the union um, is going to, for example, like, I mean, I think that board directors shouldn't be paid a stipend. I think they should be paid like a wage or be paid an hourly rate. Same with student leaders, um, same as student leaders in the organisation. Mm -hmm. So I think that things look like changing structurally the union to reflect that allows you necessarily to have more student control because there are students as staff members throughout the organisation, which incentivizes those students to work harder and contribute more to the organisation as well, which I think kind of meets a lot of the different goals that a lot of members have about the perceived lack of student involvement yeah. um, in some of those levels of the organisation. Okay, cool. So you kind of outlined a pretty strong kind of principle ideology behind mm. how the union would work. Who do you think are the board directors that would help best help you achieve that vision in the role other than, other than president? Um, I think that Eve has um, been really great on board this year, uh, particularly in like we view a lot of things in a similar way in terms of um, I don't know, like just basic principles of like collective organizing and having like increased consultation with members. She's also worked really hard to uh, try to get more international students involved in the organization, um, which has been really good. And she's, um, I don't know, she's pretty like firm in her beliefs and has been pretty consistently on, I don't know, like a similar wavelength to me throughout my time on board with her. So I think Eve would be good. Um, as I said before, I've worked a lot with Robbie and Tara. I haven't really worked with the other directors that could, like, I don't think that's, um, like, I think that's because I've shared a lot of interests that have aligned with Robbie and Tara and Eve. And that's why I think that, like, I would think that they would be best at 
um, projecting that same kind of vision. Sure. You. Yeah. So obviously it's kind of difficult for you to make decisions or judgments about other people to work mm. with if you haven't really worked with them before. Mm. Would you take their proposal seriously? Oh, I would completely take any proposal that I was given seriously. But I mean, at the end of the day, from what, like, maybe I haven't worked with them um, individually, but I have seen the way that they voted on certain motions. Sure. Like I've seen the hostility of um, certain directors to like the strike motion that I brought up at the start of last year. I've seen the hostility to certain directors about um, or not necessarily hostility, but like, I don't know, lack of enthusiasm for certain projects that I've undertaken in the same way that those other directors have. And so even if I haven't directly worked with them, I think I have a pretty clear indication of what things they do prioritise in the organisation. But I'm always going to read any proposal that's given to me. Sure. Easy. So we might move on now to a little bit of your experience uh, in your time on Union Board and just questions about implementation of policy and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so the first thing that we might ask, just a broad question, is what are the two most important things that you think you've achieved in your role so far? Um, I think the best thing I've achieved is that Sex and Consent Day is happening. Mm -hmm. and But not only that it's happening, but that the way that I've structured the program is that there... Um, is there has been a lot of member consultation in the creation of the festival. So a normal USU festival is run with, I don't know, like two, you know, humanitarian week directors. They decide the program, uh, they decide everything about it, and then the USU staff like do like, you know, an amazing job of making those ideas happen. But having said that, it still is a very kind of, you know, two students representing all the student interests to create one festival. This festival, um, like I put a call out that anyone that wanted to help um, be involved could come to a meeting and that meeting had like 20 people in attendance, the next meeting also had 20 people in attendance, the Facebook group of the organising group has 50 people there, all those people have given ideas about what they want to see in the festival, have helped with the branding of the festival, have helped with uh, the workshops that we're running and uh, like continually involved in that process and I pretty much just act as the spokesperson for the ideas that they have um, and then relay those to staff and so I'm proud of it because it's something that I said something that I ran on um, and it's happening but also because I think it's a good way forward in terms of potentially seeing that you can get benefits out of consulting with more students not only on just like what they want generally in the organization but also on a practical level how do you want this festival to be run um, and so that's the first one the second one um, like I think that, well, I mean, look, I will say the transparency review, except I'm not going to say it now because it hasn't been completed. And so yeah. I don't think I can really claim like that it's been that amazing because nothing's been passed through board yet. Um, but that is definitely something to keep an eye on um, in terms of other things. Like I really think that the um, ethnocultural uh, policy that went through board yesterday and got passed is something that I'm also really proud of. Um, the reason why I think it's important is because, you know, it obviously came out of a direct problem with that members had about um, the way that the union was, you know, throwing um, parties, which would, you know, deem as racist and cause a lot of hurt to a lot of members in the organisation. And so through that process, um, I got in contact with the Autonomous Collective Against Racism and talked to them about the possibility, because it had been vaguely floated around before, of whether or not there should be um, a policy at board level um, that, um, apply to people who experience racism and making sure that the union was structurally um, equipped to support um, people from that group. And so through that, there was the creation of the policy, but not only was the policy the creation of the portfolio, but there was also an, an apology like put through by the board. The, it also means that we're going to be looking into the creation of an autonomous space for that group. And then on top of that, it also um, puts through a number of principles, which I think that the union can... Um, really learn a lot from one of them in particular is that um, racism can only be defined or uh, identified by those who experience it. So you, you can't, we can't really have this situation anymore where people are like, oh, well, we didn't intend to be racist. Um, but that principle shows that the union is like committed to not having such, you know, a, you know, an, a, a taken aback kind of reaction to every time members complain. Yes. Having said that, I don't think that having a policy means that there's never going to be any problems um, within the organisation. And I said that when I um, put the paper forward. But in terms of allowing more members to be represented, I think that um, it's a really good step forward to stand alongside the women and people follows as well. Sure. Um, as I understand it, Sex and Consent Week 
was reduced to a day, so mm -hmm. originally it was meant to be a week. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why was this and how do you feel about the reduction to a day? Um, I think it would be great as a week, but um, I proposed the event to um, programs and because it was the first year and because they were also starting Health and Wellbeing Week this year, they just wanted to keep it to a day. Having said that, I think that the day that we are going to have is very kind of full of stuff going on and I think that potentially maybe the union should even relook at having weeks in general because you kind of get lost over over the week long period but I mean if we could expand the program I think it would be really good but I think just because it was quite different for the union to run an event that was kind of an advocacy-esque week as well as just events um, that they wanted to kind of make sure that there was that community support for it um, in the first time that it was run but then it could be expanded in the future. So you don't think it's problematic for like day-long festivals um, to perhaps not reach as many students as week-long festivals because if you don't go enough to the day you just miss out? Um, do I think, well I think it's really, like I found that there's been a lot of, prob well apparently there's been a lot of problems recently with the weeks and getting consistent attendance over the week because people actually get confused but this is just an operational thing like I don't really think that um, that's that linked to you know the problem of whether or not it was a week or a day. Um, yeah, I don't know, does that make sense? I can explain it again. Um, so a lot of your policies uh, have not yet been implemented, such as uh, AA for crew identifying board candidates, uh, Weekly Ball Magazine. Um, why, have the, why have these not been implemented? Okay, so Queer AA, they were, during the Queer Review last year, it, because that was a policy that I ran on, we had consultation with the queer community as part of that review and the queer community, they didn't feel like they wanted okay. to have Queer AA. So what we've also done in response to this is, given that I've created the ethnocultural portfolio and given next year, all of the first year board directors um, are not uh, people who experience racism. Um, then I'm, try I'm looking into, um, with even Robbie, changing the regulations and duty statements to say that, because the whole reason why I suggested um, Queer AA last year was because it's supposed to be an autonomous position, but it goes to the honorary secretary if no one is eligible. That is potentially what the problem with um, ethnocultural might also be in its first year. But as a result of that, I'm looking into changing the regulations for, and with Eve and Robbie as well, for all three of them, to be that the portfolio will pass, can pass to an executive member who also identifies um, as coming from that area or failing anyone on the board identifying coming from that particular area. Uh, a board member that with consultation with community members specific to that uh, area, that's how it would be determined as well. So you couldn't get, you know, someone who was, you know, potentially racist and the honorary secretary getting their portfolio and same with queer. Um, so I think like the problem that I identified is being um, combated in other ways, but also that, you know, if you think something is a good idea, but through member consultation with more people from that, um, that you know, queer AA would affect, and they said they didn't want it. I think you have to listen to what the members want and change in that instance. The second policy that you mentioned was uh, weekly ball. Yeah, so weekly ball is coming under the ball review, which I um, I mentioned that I'm currently undertaking because I don't know if you heard, but the ball was going to go purely online at the start of this year. But when I heard that, I kind of freaked out, and I was like, I'm not really sure if this is what if we should go just online or whether or not it should be a combination. Um, of both and because I obviously like have a back background as an audio editor and I'm on the comms working party I said that I would do a review um, into Bull magazine and so this Thursday at 1 p.m. there's a meeting a meeting a uh, members forum uh, about the bull and so the weekly bull is going to be addressed in that as well like would you prefer it as a weekly bull would you prefer it as a daily bull like it used to be do you think the bull should only go online and through that consultation process I think that that's how I can figure out if I do Im implement that policy or whether or not the members want something different as well. Sure so it seems like you run on policies which you then um, sort of sought to consult with the members after your election mm -hmm. to um, see if they should be implemented or not. Mm -hmm. So why would you, I guess, choose to run those policies in the first place? The reason, because I still think that they're a good thing, but the reason why you conduct a review is because often if you're in an organisation and you're going to be, you know, interrupting, like, or changing the way that certain staff members, like, have their operations, they need the chance to be able to put their input as well into whether or not 
into what the actual circumstance is, like how many bulls are wasted at the moment, like all that information that I didn't have when I ran. And so I think that this is still a step in implementing the policies that I said I was going to implement. Like I've taken action on almost all of the policies that I put in unless there were reasons why they were completely impossible. So I don't really view it as incongruent to make sure that you're making the right policy. But I think that, you know, when I ran it, it said that, I think that student media is important. I think that we should increase the you know, capacity of student media within the organisation. Therefore, I think that the bull should be weekly. But if I then find out that the you know, entire budget of the union is such that if we were to make it a weekly bull, like the amount of wastage of bull on the stats they already have would go up and members and the editors themselves like, please don't give that to us. We don't have the ability to do it. I think it would kind of be awful to just go in and do it anyway. But definitely like, want to look into doing it, which is why I'm conducting the review. Okay, so you um you mentioned staff in the answer to the last question. We might move on to some questions about the relationship between board directors and staff. Mm-hmm. So one of your major policies when you ran for election was reminding the CEO that he should act as a servant of the student board directors. Mm-hmm. A major concern raised by a number of board directors during the Rowie case was that a culture of top-down management and disrespect for student directors had emerged. In light of your policy, do you feel that, there, that more needs to be done to limit the influence of senior staff? I don't like... Definitely. I think that fundamentally what's important is, though, is that, like, I think that in the past um, it's also come from having a fractured board or a complacent board that has made, you know, that have, you know, obviously changed the the interrelationships um, of the organisation. So so I think that any executive that is elected needs to make sure that um, that they are, are aware of what, the staff do in the organisation what they can help with, but also what the staff should be doing in terms of following up board directors' recommendations at a current meeting. So, for example, if I pass, you know, the motion that I passed yesterday on ethnocultural, it's the responsibility of the president and the executive to make sure that they can see that the staff, um, or at least consult with the CEO, because then the CEO talks to all the other staff. That's how it works. Like, that they have a working relationship with the CEO that is positive but not positive to the extent that the CEO has more pressure exerted on them than they do um, on the CEO, which is obviously quite a difficult scenario given that as, I don't know, young people working in an organisation with someone who's been in the organisation for far, far longer, it there's a tendency for that relationship to get skewed. But I think the way that you combat that is by having a board that um, is kind of that you see yourself as president as representative of all of the board and that it's important for you to keep strong the board's interests at all times with the ceo no matter what member of the board that is so i like believe that a president should if the ceo is treating a member that isn't them bad straight away speak to the ceo and make sure that that relationship stays constructive with all directors. Does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that relationship has been skewed at the moment? Like, as things stand, does it work in that way or is there ways that that would have to work differently? Um, does it work in that way? Well, no, because I don't really think that that happens that much at the moment. Sure. Like, I feel like often the CEO has done things that um, I've disagreed with and I've spoken up about that, but I think that if the complaint isn't coming from another individual board director, they'll usually not enter into that conflict just because it makes their job easier. Sure. Um, uh, Woodward at a USC board meeting on the 2nd of May uh, publicly noted that there was no disregard of student directors by staff and that there were no favourites. Uh, do you agree with this? Uh, do you think you could work more closely with, uh, work closely with Woodward as part of your position on a USC executive? Um, I think I could work closely um, with Andrew. I've worked with Andrew on a lot of different products. Uh, projects <laughs> oh no um in terms of what was your second question the first part of it sorry um do you agree with uh, Woodward's statements no i don't agree with Woodward's statements like i don't think that there is a good relationship between the board and the union at the moment like i've you know i've said that the at tom's agm that when i was elected i was called into the hr's office and you know like said that no one, none of the staff members wanted me to get elected. Like, I think that's a pretty significant thing to say Mm -hmm. to a newly elected board director. And I think that, you know, that, and it doesn't always come from like, you know, a bad place in those staff members. It's just that they've worked in the organization for a long time and they very, some people have very strong opinions about what that organization organization should look like. Some board directors might have a more similar view to them about what that organization should look like as well, which means that those who don't, 
have the same view can often um, be treated um, in worse than other directors. But that's why I think that it's important for those directors, even if they might have a similar view for the union or at least not feel the same way as those other directors, it's important for them to stand up as directors and look after the student interests by acting as a cohesive unit. Mm. That's good. Um, so incoming board director and fellow grassroots member Ed McMahon campaigned on a platform to source the next USU CEO from the not-for-profit sector. Would you renew Andrew Woodward's contract? Um, would I renew Andrew Woodward's contract? I don't think I'm allowed to uh, say that. Mm -hmm. um, I think like it would breach my like fiduciary duty to the organisation, so I think I'd decline sure. to comment. Do, do you think he's fulfilling his position currently as he should be fulfilling that position? Or uh, well, it? I think that there are definitely areas to, like, to, that he could improve on in terms of his relationship with the board. Sure. Um, maybe then we'll move on to some transparency questions. Sure. Okay, have you got one? Um, transparency is certainly the flavour of the month amongst recently elected board mm -hmm. directors, I'm sure you're aware. Uh, which policies would you work on to, deli to, to deliver to ensure transparency? Okay, well, which, like, the transparency review, which is coming to the next June board meeting, hopefully in that review, um, well, I personally believe that... Uh, Everyone should be allowed to be tweeted at board meetings. That's one thing. Secondly, I think that all uh, director, all, all reports, or pre I would prefer, prefer that all reports tabled at board meetings were available on a Dropbox that all members could access. Failing that, if it's found that like that could potentially contain like information which might harm the organisation from a legal perspective, I think that every board director should then take it upon themselves to write a report at every meeting that details what they've done that month. Currently, that's done by like the president and the vice president, but um, and the executive. But other directors don't do that. I think that all directors should do that. Firstly, but secondly, at least those reports should be made public to students because I think that ensures that it is very clear on a month month basis what people are doing, and it allows like a reporting mechanism that means that you don't have to ask all these questions about what I've done at the end of the year and I could have just reported it easily throughout the year <laughs> and saved this hassle. But um, no, it's fine. And on top of that, I also think that um, what are the parts of the transparency review? The, uh, um, oh yeah, so I think that also like informal board meetings that happen on the Thursdays and stuff. I think we should look into whether or not this is the most um, constitutionally sound thing to be doing in terms of making decisions. Um, in my head, I think it would be much better if we had like a meeting on Friday every week at the exact same time. But once a month, all of the staff members came and at every other meeting, it was just uh, the board um, that were there. So that obviously we don't have to take every Friday out of all the staff members um, working lives, but that that would allow like students to come and see those meetings. Uh, on top of that, I think it would be good if that doesn't happen for there to be minutes taken at every uh, informal board meeting by a committee secretary and those to also be uploaded to the Dropbox. I think there are like a lot of other different kind of pegs of the transparency plan, but there are just a few of what the stuff happened. I don't want to talk forever about yeah. it. Yeah. So we might move on to some kind of a recent controversy within the union and just see about your thoughts on that. So uh, the first thing is uh, about the Senate appointed directors. Uh, will you be seeking the vote of a Senate appointed director for your position? And have you ever sought or courted their vote? Um, no and no. I recently wrote a report um, on the function of the Senate appointed directors in the union. Um, it pretty much just sent out questions to all the different board directors about what they saw of the positives of their role were, what they saw of the negatives. Ideally, would you like there to be Senate appointed directors yes or no, failing both of those things, would you prefer it if the Senate appointed directors that the board nominated were A, students, um, or uh, and then within that it was like from either like an international student or a postgrad or any number of different groups that you could um, consider. You know, every member of the board responded that, that in ideally we wouldn't have um, Senate appointed directors at all. Oh, sorry, the third part of it was, I don't know, my numbers are... My number is totally off. But <laughs> the other part of it is that whether or not we should restrict their vote. So whether or not they should have a more a similar function to the immediate past president, where they sit at board director at, at board meetings, they provide advice, but they don't have any voting capacity, or failing that if they just don't have a vote, voting capacity in executive elections. Across the board, all board directors that responded to my survey were like that they would like, ideally prefer us to have um, an organisation that was entirely run by students and had a board of students and if we wanted to have advice we would contract that advice out. 
over this period where we then met up with um, David Pacey, who's the secretary to the Senate, to talk about whether or not that was possible. He said that it would be possible, but would have to wait until the election of the new executive and then talk to the Chancellor about that. So I've written that paper, which we're taking to the Chancellor after the uh, you know executive election. Um, so I think that's a step forward in terms of personally, would um, I seek their vote? No, I've actually from that paper created a second paper which I've given to the current executive and the current executive I believe this weekend are meeting up with them to advise them of the reasons why it might not be prudent um, to vote uh, sure. in terms of the members feelings that they haven't been directors for six months yep. uh, and a number of other things. Okay so yeah I mean it's, it's kind of easy for a lot of candidates to, set, to pay lip service to the idea that they wouldn't support the Senate appointed directors or wouldn't seek their vote or anything. Would first of all if you found out that somebody was seeking their votes would you speak out against it and second um, would you, oh sorry, it's just really, would you make public mm. your disdain for them having sold those votes? Yeah, I would, and I would probably, like, I would make it public. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so another, sorry, just like a recent controversy question. Um, has Robbie Magyar, who said that you might be able to work with before, has his recent involvement in pursuing a complaint against Liam Carrigan affected your likelihood of voting for him as president? Um, yeah, like, I was really disappointed with what Robbie did. Like, I was um, pretty upset. Like, I think that it's one thing to like have a you know legitimate complaint and want to pursue that i just like f found it you know strange that robbie was involved in pr the preparation of a complaint that another uh member was giving and the reason why that upset me um because like as i said before like i think the regulations are incredibly important i think people are always entitled to make complaints but the reason why it upset me was because it just i don't know it, it like it seemed a bit underhanded. Like I didn't, I told Robbie that I didn't think it looked, you know, particularly good that um, he did that. Whether or not it affects whether or not I give him the vote for president, as I said before, like I think that my decision will be based on what proposals they give. Obviously every interaction that I've had with both Tara and Robbie will also come into play with like my understanding of, you know, them as people. But right now those things being, somewhat equal as they are, I want to see what their ideas are. Sure, sure. Okay. Um, just talking back to the Senate appointed directors, um, we ran a bit of advocacy early in the year, which mm -hmm. sort of declined their role and asked on current board directors mm -hmm. to, I guess, uh, make known their intentions to not seek their votes and to sort of divide them publicly as well. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you not support that advocacy? Um, because the, uh, a couple of reasons. Firstly, I don't think that like signing the contract, I was unsure of my obligations to the organisation um, signing that and decrying like people who were at that point, which they're not at the moment, like sitting uh, members uh, of the board because it was undermining like the system by which the board um, made decisions. Also because it was in the middle of the Tom kind of saga and personally like I believe that that is potentially something which could be interpreted as censurable. So that's like another reason. Um, also, I, yeah, I don't know. Like, does that make sense? Like, I mean, I agree with the sentiment that the Senate appointed should like vote. I agree that I will not like seek their vote. That's never changed. I just like, at the time, like it just, I didn't think that it was something that would, um, I thought it was something that might harm my position in the organization and was potentially something that was outside of the remit of my director's duties. Sure. So j just related to that, to that answer, um, a lot of people seem to suggest that the idea of censoring looms large over a lot of board directors, mm -hmm. and they feel it's kind of out of line to speak out against the organisation, yeah. because in the past, censoring has been used so loosely against yeah. particular people. Do you think that the organisation should have clearer stipulations about when that, that yeah. kind of motion should be passed? Yeah, so that's another thing that's coming in the transparency review. I'm sure everyone's very excited mm -hmm. to see it go through in the end. Um, but yeah, like I completely think that there should be clearer guidelines because obviously the regulations appear to be things upon which reasonable minds may differ. Um, I don't believe that any of the times that the censoring has been used, it's actually been uh, like a fair interpretation of, of the regulations, but I don't know what my fellow directors would interpret them to be. So I still kind of need to act within that to, to ensure that I can keep doing what I want to do within the organisation. Oh, yeah. um, do we want to ask one last question? Sure. Um, so talk us through how you decided to vote on Maui's dismissal from board 
um, what factors you consider? Um, so I was with Tom, like on the picket lines. Like I've seen Tom be brutalized by police on a number of occasions, as I've unfortunately seen a lot of my close friends. Like I think that when Tom, you know, released the information that revealed that the university had collaborated with management, um, sorry, had collaborated with the police to, and actually had control over when students were arrested. Like, I think that is disgusting. And I think that's something that the members of the union um, needed to know. And, you know, as I said before, like I respect my fiduciary duties, but sometimes your fiduciary duties can conflict within interpretations of them. So yes, like there might be a duty that Tom had to confidentiality, but concurrently to that, he has a duty to uphold the interests of the membership of the union. I believe that in that instance, his interpretation uh, was correct. It's something that I probably would have done the same thing if I was in his position and I had that information because of like, that's how I view um, the duties. But even if that's not how you viewed them, I think in the circumstances of the reasons why he released that information and also just having like any empathy towards this, like what that leak represented and the fact that Tom went to the staff member in question and asked her and she said, oh, I'd prefer it if you didn't, but if you do, don't put my name on it. The fact that he was owed no procedural fairness by the organisation, the fact that um, other directors didn't even ask him about like his personal circumstances, that he was asked to come to the meeting to speak about it without even being primed on what the complaint was about, and the fact that staff went fishing for information to remove him. I think like there are any number of reasons why I voted the way that I did, and that's also why I wasn't a party to the court case as well. So do you think that he should, uh, the view is you should pay his fees for him? Pay his fees, absolutely. Okay. And what would you do in response to other board directors who say, for example, suggest that the board directors who are uh, participants in the case against Rowie should foot the fees? Um, I think, well, I brought some of the meeting, but I think that the way that the actual opting in to fees wasn't actually explained to us very well by the executive. I personally was called up and was like, do you want to know if we have the power constitutionally to kick off a director? This is just a question of the regulations and wanting to have a, an idea about what the regulations mean. So I was like, oh, all right, like maybe. And then I thought about it and I was like, no, no, I definitely don't want to do this. But like, that's the way that it was presented to me. I think that's the way it was presented to a lot of people. It wasn't really clearly sought through what having representation meant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a failing of the executive and also something that I would want to see happen in the future, like you need to explain exactly what, you know, the remit of legal um, representation meant. We were never told, like, if you disagree with the case of the union, you are also entitled to representation outside of that, which, you know, we, we were, but not under those grounds. And that was never presented to us. So yeah, this is, this is kind of a related question. That's quite similar to the censoring idea. But do you think that legalism and the use of legalistic terms and ideas that most students who don't study law wouldn't understand mm -hmm often acts as a threat and a pressure for students to act conservatively? Yeah, I think it definitely is. So, so I would hope that there would be like some way to counterbalance that. Um, it's hard to know what it would be except making sure that directors that do have that knowledge like share fully with other directors what the you know, implications of the choices that they're making are. But it is something which is difficult in, you know, not only for directors but in like all areas of life, like overly legalistic, you know, forms of like appeal or you know or just bureaucracy like make it very hard for a lot of people to do things in their everyday lives like i think it's a you know an extension of that but yeah i don't know right awesome thanks very much for your time